I advertised that this talk would be about emptiness because it's a big concept in Buddhism. It's a kind of core concept and it seems to confuse a lot of people. I've heard many knowledgeable religious leaders talk about Buddhists not believing in anything or wanting to disappear or wanting to be about nothing. So I thought I'd talk about that, but to do that, I have to talk a little bit about Buddha and Buddhism. So here's a little bit of history. So Buddha was born about 2,500 years ago and um, 500 something BC, although there have been recent um, excavations that have pushed the date of his birth back 600 years. So it would have been 3,000 years ago. And he grew up in uh, part of Nepal. His father was a tribal leader. And before uh, European nations colonized India and the Middle East, it was organized by tribes, not by states. So in places like Pakistan today, the Pashtuns are a huge nation. There was no Iraq. Iraq was an invention of post-war adjustments. And one of the problems there is it threw all sorts of Sunnis and Shias together. And whereas once they'd all had their own territory and their own customs, things got turned around. So Buddha's father was a ruler of a, of a tribe, a large tribe. And Buddha was raised to be a warrior. He was raised to be a soldier. And uh, his father went to great lengths like we all do to kind of see that our kids have a perfect life. In Buddha's case, he lived on a huge estate, thousands of acres of hunting and streams and places to play. And his father uh, saw to it that he didn't leave. At least this is, this is the Buddhist myth. This is what people are told. So one day when he was, he was married, he had children, he had concubines, he had everything he needed. But one day he got his chariot driver to take him outside the palace walls and he went into town. And um, it was there that he supposedly first encountered sickness, old age and death. He saw a very old woman hobbling along on a cane and he'd never seen anything unsightly or unattractive or jarring. Later he saw people dying in the streets. He saw bodies being burned. He saw all sorts of illnesses and suffering and unhappiness and it kind of unhinged him i mean he became obsessed with the subject he became so obsessed with why we suffer and what suffering is that one day he stole away from the palace he left his wife and family he knew that they'd be wanting for nothing and he went and he joined a bunch of ascetics living in the forest and these guys were kind of caught in a dichotomy of, of uh, matter versus spirit. They were punishing their bodies. They were ignoring the material world to try to uh, achieve a kind of spiritual enlightenment. You used to see something like it at Grateful Dead concerts. People high on acid coursing through nirvana in filthy clothes, unwashed, unput together. It was the same kind of feeling, like the material doesn't matter, it's the spirit that counts. So Buddha did this for six years. He lived with these people. And then one day he decided he had to up his game and he went and sat under a big banyan tree. Banyan tree is a strange tree because it sends roots down from the branches. They're huge. So there are these columns that come down and people live in those columns. And Buddha sat in one of those columns and he vowed that he was not going to move until he got enlightened. And while he was there, again, according to legend, a milkmaid came by with a big bowl of warm, fresh cow's milk, full of cream, full of nourishment. And Buddha was so thin and starving and there are statues of Buddha meditating, which you can see all his ribs. He's just on the verge of death. And he drank this bowl of milk and it nourished him, gave him strength. 
and he vowed not to leave his seat until he achieved enlightenment. And during that night, uh, the myths have it that all sorts of temptations were laid before him. Mara, the great temptress, threw demons up in front of him, threw beautiful women, threw every kind of attraction to throw him off his game. A huge cobra is supposed to have come and established himself over Buddha's head to protect him. And there are little statues you can get of Buddha sitting under a cobra. They're pretty groovy. Anyway, in the morning, the morning star rose and Buddha had his breakthrough. And he understood something about emptiness. He understood something about dependent origination, how everything was hooked up and not separate, that the separateness of things was an illusion, that there was a fundamental mm -hmm. unity to the universe. So let's fast forward 500 years. Uh, the main sect of Buddhism was called the Saravastadans, and they were people who felt that um, the world could be known that Buddha had broken it down into systems and they were, they were great for making lists. They, they compiled a, a, an encyclopedia that would account for the phenomenal world without the ego. It's called the Abhidharma. And there was a leading scholar of the time named Shariputra. And Shariputra made these incredible lists. Uh, he would have, um, I have some lists here. Um, the five skandhas, the 12 abodes of sensation, the 18 elements of perception, 12 links of dependent uh, origination. And these people held sway. And today we call this, they were called the Saravastadans, but today we call them Hinayana, which is the smaller vehicle, because their primary concern was self-enlightenment. They were trying to reach nirvana they were trying to reach a breakthrough and they were basically concerned for themselves around 2000 years ago uh, starting around the first century a.d the mahayana understanding began to evolve mahayana means great vehicle and their goal was to achieve enlightenment for everybody even my dog um and they began to critique the Saravastan understanding. And there was a sutra, which is a teaching that was written. And the smallest, most condensed uh, version of Buddha's teaching is called the Heart Sutra. In Sanskrit, it's the Prajna Paramita Sutra. So Prajna means wisdom but the word's broken in half. So pra means uh, before, and jna means knowing. So it's actually the knowing you have before you know anything. So I'm going to read the Heart Sutra, talk about it a little bit. So the Heart Sutra, there's a couple things I have to tell you about it so that you can make sense of it. It's called the Maha Prajna Paramita Sutra, the great understanding of wisdom, great wisdom. So it's cast as a little dramatic play. And, and the first word is it, the, the person who's doing the teaching is Avalokiteshvara. And Avalokiteshvara we call Kuan Yin sometimes. You've all seen her. Sometimes it's a man, sometimes a woman. But the Bodhisattva is the one who hears the suffering of the world and is there to help people. So it's an incarnation of Buddha 500, 600 years after the Buddha died. That's the way it's looked at. And um, sometimes you see uh, statues of Buddha with hundreds of arms. They're all to be helping people or all emblem of helping. Closest thing she would be would be maybe the Virgin Mary, the way people regard the Virgin Mary as a great heart of compassion. So Avalokiteshvara is teaching. And the thing about the Bodhisattva, this word Bodhisattva, 
is it was a great addition to human thought. I don't know if you've ever been uh, involved in a group effort where everybody's trying to do something noble and pure, or even on, in a monastery, there's a temptation for people to get kind of ruthless. Well, if I can just get enlightenment, then I'll turn around and help everyone. And that leads to no good. So the bodhisattvas uh, concept was that they would be the last to be enlightened. They'll help everyone else across and they'll go last. So it was an emblem of selflessness and that lack of craving enlightenment, that lack of uh, demanding it, left them free to help other people. So the first line is Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, when practicing deeply the Prajna Paramita, which is the kind of meditation that we're doing. Perceived that all five skandhas in their own being are empty and was saved from all suffering. Now the skandhas, the word skanda relates to the trunk of a tree. And that was an early understanding that eyes, ears, nose, mouth were each supported by a trunk of consciousness. So Avalokiteshvara has just had a new look and he's saying for the first time, these skandhas are empty. They don't exist as separate things. So now he turns around and he talks to this guy, Shariputra, who was the most famous scholar of the time. And he says, O oh, Shariputra, form does not differ from emptiness. Emptiness does not differ from form. That which is form is emptiness. That which is emptiness, form. The same is true of feelings, perceptions, impulses, and consciousness. That was one of Shariputra's lists, that a human being was consistent of these five skandhas, form, feeling, impulse, sensation, consciousness. So right away, he's stepping into his turf, stepping on his robe. He says, O Shariputra, all dharmas, dharma means truth. All dharmas are marked with emptiness meaning that's their core nature. They do not appear or disappear, are not tainted nor pure, do not increase or decrease. Well, that's a world very different than the world of our daily understanding where I'm over here and you're over there. We see people being born, we see people dying, we see trees coming, changing. So he's going to talk about it. So this is what he says. Now he's describing emptiness. And what's interesting about this sutra is it's all cast in negatives. And it's cast in negatives because he's basically systematically destroying this earlier Saravastadin uh, understanding that you could study hard, you could get enough knowledge that you could understand the whole world. So he says, therefore, in emptiness, no form, no feeling, no perceptions, no impulses, no consciousness, no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no color, no sound, no smell, no taste, no touch, no object of mind. This was another one of, of Shariputra's concepts. Mind, and then there's an object of mind. There's eye, and there's an object of eye. And when the two meet, Consciousness is created. No realm of eyes until no realm of mind consciousness. No ignorance and also no extinction of it. That's worth stopping there a second. Because form and emptiness sounds like a dichotomy. Form's over here, emptiness is over there. Emptiness is the real stuff. Form is the invisible, is the you know, stuff that's changing. But later on in the Heart Sutra, it says form is form and emptiness is emptiness. It's not a dualism. We say sun-faced Buddha, moon-faced Buddha. They're different expressions of the same thing, like waves and the ocean. No ignorance and also no extinction of it until no old age and death and also no extinction of it. 
No suffering, no origination, no stopping, no path, no cognition, also no attainment. There's nothing nameable, graspable that you can attain. With nothing to attain, the bodhisattva depends on prajna paramita. He meditates, and the mind is no hindrance. Without any hindrance, no fears exist. Far apart from every perverted view, he, she dwells in nirvana. In the three worlds, all Buddhas depend on prajna paramita and attain anuttara samyak sambodai, unsurpassed, complete, perfect enlightenment. So he says, there know the prajna paramita is the great transcendent mantra. He's, the mantra, you know, is a phrase, and he's going to give us this phrase by which to remember this teaching. It's the great bright mantra. It's the utmost mantra. It's the supreme mantra, which is able to relieve all suffering and is true, not false. So proclaim the prajna paramita mantra. Proclaim the mantra which says, gate, gate, paragate, parasangate, bodhi svaha. Svaha means done, accomplished. And then it's translated in English. It means gone, gone, gone beyond, gone beyond, beyond, bodhi svaha. So that's the most famous sutra in all of Buddhism, and it tackles the question of emptiness head on. So, the Buddhists had three understandings of wisdom, still do actually. There's mundane wisdom, everyday wisdom, which has everything backwards. It views the impermanent as permanent, it sees the impure as pure, it, what has no self as having a self. And this is the way most of the world lives. Most of the world thinks we have a self. It's kind of a thing, even if I don't know where it is or what color it is or exactly where it's located, I know who I am. And we say things like, uh, he knows who he is. If you know who you were, it means you're no longer in process. It means you have a defined shape, a fixed shape, a fixed identity. And that's the fundamental ignorance that Buddha saw through. Then the next level is metaphysical wisdom. People who, you know, study the mysteries and they, we get more sophisticated and our understanding is a little more nuanced. And so metaphysical wisdom views what appears to be permanent as impermanent, views what appears to be pure as impure, and what appears to have a self as not having a self. But really, it, I mean, it's an advancement. It's closer to the way things are, but both of them result in having attachment to views and ideas and concepts and knowledge, and even the idea of transcendental wisdom. And it leads a lot of people off the path because when we look for teachers, we keep looking for somebody out of the ordinary. So, a lot of transcendental charlatans, a lot of people who are, we expect to be more perfect than they are. They may have profound insight about something, but they're not a special being. There's only this reality. And the idea of looking for a different state of mind in which the weather's always sunny, that's mundane wisdom. That's, that ain't happening. So finally, Transcendent wisdom, which is where we get into Zen practice or Maha uh, Prajna Paramita. Uh, transcendent wisdom looks at all things, mundane or metaphysical, both sides of the spectrum, as neither permanent nor impermanent. They're beyond description. No old age and death, and also no extinction of it. Buddha didn't say the self was real or false. He just said it wasn't permanent. They see that things are neither pure nor impure, neither having or not having a self, because it's all inconceivable and inexpressible. 
it's all operating on a level beyond language. And language, for all the gifts it gives us, for everything wonderful it does for us, it exacts a tax. It tends to reify the things that it names, it tends to make us feel that they're fixed and real. And there are several consequences from that. Once you get the idea of a tree, you don't have to really look at each tree separately. That's efficient, but it's also a loss. You don't have to look at each person. Oh, yeah, I know that guy. He wears his hair that way. He's got an earring. Got it. This is part of the problem with naming. We can't get on without it, but it's only one half of the equation, right? I talked about self and other. I talked about waves and the ocean. Each little wave that comes up, each little wavelet, something in the universe that could be named. It appears to be a singular person. Could be a person. Sometimes I imagine, you know, shy waves or insecure waves or really bold waves, and I'm the baddest wave in the ocean. And just like us, they rise up into form, they hang around for a while, and they go back to the ocean. We call the hanging around for a while living, and we call the ocean dying. But what we forget and what the waves forget is that they've never, for one instant, not been part of the ocean. And neither have we. And so what emptiness is about is not really nothingness. Emptiness is about erasing the artificial distinctions between things. That the distinctions that we see as so fixed and permanent are transitory. Our life is transitory. This body is transitory. The institutions of men, you look at the Parthenon, you look, go to Machu Picchu, you see these things that were once appeared to be permanent to the citizens of those places. And now there are little Peruvian peanut vendors selling in the ruins of Machu Picchu. So this idea of emptiness. So Suzuki Roshi has a has a quote I want to read um, because it's very germane. And this is the way we bring this kind of theoretical stuff into our life. Suzuki Roshi says, we have to believe in something which has no form and no color. Something which exists before all forms and colors. No matter what God or doctrine you believe in, if you become attached to it, your belief will be based more or less on a self-centered idea. So it's very hard for us to stay alert to the fact that we view the world through our ego. Because normally we don't have another place to step outside of it. So everything we see is through this spectrum of what Buddhists call small mind. Big mind is what's outside the ego. It's like putting a salt cellar on a table. The salt cellar is the self. The table is the space it's in. So why does he say we have to believe in something that we can't see, that has no color and has no form? Well, one reason we have to believe in it is because if we don't, we're always trapped in the domain of our small mind. We can never see the world objectively. We can never see other people without filtering them through our prejudices, what we like and what we don't like. This is why in the very first Dharma talk, I talked about forms and the importance of like sitting a certain way, whether you like it or not. The part of you that doesn't like it and honors that is the part that gets you in trouble, is the part that gets unhappy, is the part that does stupid stuff. So this idea of a kind of Pregnant, formless energy 
generating the things of the world. That's a dangerous metaphor because it, it sounds dualistic. But one way that I first began trying to understand it was to imagine that emptiness itself is just visible through the forms it makes. You can't see it. And the fact that there's an infinite, an infinity of available forms shows us that formlessness has no boundaries. If it had color, a color, we couldn't see certain colors. If it had a shape, it couldn't make certain shapes. So unless you have this idea of emptiness, unless you can accept the fact that you can kind of dissolve all your filters and dissolve your prisms and dissolve your fixed ways of doing things, and that you will get an unimaginable sense of freedom. Because when we look at the world through our small self, we can't imagine transcending the boundaries of that small self. It never occurs to us that the back of our head is open <laughs> into the entire solar system, or that our spinal telephone is plugged into the cosmic switchboard, and it's all coming through. So, Emptiness is not nothing. Emptiness is not um, the denigration of the material world. Emptiness in the Heart Sutra I just read, Shariputra, form is not different than emptiness. Emptiness is not different than form. Why do we say a form is empty? We say a form is empty because it's not made of a singular thing. It's made of non-self elements. This thing I call a self, according to Buddhist scripture, is made up of body, form, impulse, sensation, consciousness. It's made up of sunlight. It's made up of water. It's made up of the microbes in the soil that grew my food. It's made up of pollinating insects. I'm inseparable from all that. And the fact that I have this body for a while, this form for a while, gives me the illusion that I have a separate existence. Separate from oxygen? How long will that work? Separate from water? How long will that work? Separate from the people growing my food? Separate from doctor? Come on. So you can get it intellectually, but the whole practice of the, of the mantra the gate, gate, para gate, para sam gate, bodhisvaha, is to remind you of that entire sutra. Therefore, an emptiness, no form, no feeling, no perceptions, no impulses, no consciousness, no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no color, no sound, no smell, no taste, no object of mind, no realm of eyes until no realm of mind consciousness, no ignorance and also no extinction of it until no old age and death and also no extinction of it. That's the wild land. That's the wild kingdom. And we are wild inside because it's wild out there. And we lose a lot when we settle for only domesticity, when we settle for only being good little boys and girls, not having access to our real birthright of the deepest transcendental knowledge. So that's a big bite. I think that's enough for today.